Welcome to Beneath the Bible, where we're helping you dig deeper and uncover the world beneath the sacred book. Humankind's relationship to animals goes back as far as the human species itself, and it's still a big part of our modern world. We tend to associate animals with particular traits. For example, dogs are loyal, cats are independent and aloof, foxes are sly, owls are wise, and donkeys are stubborn. Here in the United States, the bald eagle is a symbol of our country. We tend to think of these associations as universal, but in fact they are all culturally bound. The things we associate certain animals with in our cultural, cultural world may not be the same in other cultures. For example, in cultures which practice Hinduism, the cow is revered as sacred, but not so much in America. When we look at associations around particular animals, we can see differences across cultures today. So we shouldn't be surprised that the same is true when we look at past cultures. Ancient cultures had different attitudes about animals as well, and that's what we're looking at in this series. Today, we're going to look at some perceptions of donkeys in the ancient world. Now, donkeys were a mainstay of life in the ancient world. Wild donkeys, or onagers, were part of the natural fauna of the biblical world, but most biblical references are to domesticated donkeys or to donkey crossbreeds. Excavations have revealed domesticated donkey bones at pre-Bronze Age sites, indicating that they were part of life in the ancient Near East before and throughout the entire biblical period. Horses entered the Near Eastern world relatively late, likely sometime in the Middle Bronze Age, between 2000 and 1500 BC. So donkeys were the primary equids in use in this part of the world. As we'll see, donkeys had some associations in the ancient world that we share, and some that might be different than we expect. Throughout the ancient world, donkeys were used as beasts of burden to carry people and belongings. Even after the introduction of horses, donkeys were what most people used for this type of work. Horses were limited to use by the elite and for military purposes. If you wanted to use an animal to plow your field, you could use an ox or a donkey. If you're traveling a long distance, you could ride a donkey or have it carry your belongings. In many cultures, donkeys thus represented a relatively low status. In Egypt in particular, donkeys were certainly used, but Egyptian people are not often shown riding them. Instead, Egyptian art depicts foreigners, particularly Asiatics, riding donkeys. Here though, we see an example from an Old Kingdom chapel in which Egyptian workers are using donkeys that have been loaded with goods. And here, we can see workers driving the donkeys to tread on the grain in the threshing floor. Donkeys were often the butt of jokes in Egypt, where they were called Eeyore after the sound that they made. So if everyone were to where Winnie the Pooh's donkey friend got his name, here it is. Al could have told you that. This drawing on a, of a relief, this drawing of a relief shows how this could have worked in art. It depicts the Prince of Punt, a country to the south of Egypt, with his wife Ati, who is depicted as quite overweight, and his two sons and daughter follow behind. They bring with them a saddled donkey, which the inscription tells us is the Queen's steed. Since the Egyptians generally did not ride donkeys, this was meant to be extra funny that she would need a pack animal to carry her. Donkeys were such a common part of daily life and folk custom that they appear in folk wisdom sayings like these from Egypt. We really have no idea what the second one is even supposed to mean here. Donkeys were also well known as beasts of burden for caravan travel. If you're going to conduct a long distance trade, donkeys loaded with goods and donkey drawn carts were the primary ways of moving ca cargo. This Egyptian saying reinforces this idea that donkeys were really your best option for carrying cargo. This is simply their function in the world. And these terracotta figurines from Cyprus show donkeys with, with the long ears, uh, with large bags or baskets on their sides for cargo. In Syria, Palestine, donkeys were generally more prized than they were in Egypt, but still the primary means of transport for people and cargo if you are not going on foot. We see in textual references the phrase, to saddle a donkey is synonymous with to start a journey. Even the term ass load is a fairly precise measurement used in the ancient sources to refer to the amount an average donkey could carry. From the tune of Khnumhotep II at Beni Hassan in Egypt, we see this depiction of Asiatic or Syro-Palestinian peoples visiting Egypt. Now this is an incredibly important tomb for understanding Egyptian and Palestinian dynamics, but for now we just want to highlight that the Asiatic people are bringing some antelope, but primarily donkeys, further showing the Egyptians associating, the Egyptians associating donkeys with Asiatic people.
In addition to their practical functions, donkeys in Syria, Palestine, and Mesopotamia also had certain ritual usages. In the early and middle Bronze Ages, or roughly before 1500 BC, donkeys are, are found in burial contexts. In the early Bronze Age, in what is now Israel, donkeys are often found buried under structures. These are interpreted as a donkey being sacrificed and buried as part of a foundation deposit. Because the bones are neatly articulated, it is clear that these animals weren't killed and buried intentionally these animals were killed and buried intentionally and not simply flung into a pit than a house built over them. The consistent use of donkeys in this practice points to them as both, highly value, as both high value and religiously significant animals. Their sacrifice was intended to protect the structure and its occupants. And while these sites are found in what is today Israel, the practice predates the emergence of ancient Israel and doesn't appear to have been practiced by the Israelites at all. Prior to the introduction of the domesticated horse, donkeys or onagers were used to pull carts and chariots. The site of Ur in Mesopotamia, archaeologists in the mid-1800s and early 1900s excavated the Royal Cemetery of Ur, which dates to the mid-3rd millennium, around 2600 BC. These elaborate tombs had high-status individuals interred in them, including, remarkably, donkeys. These donkeys were inten intentionally interred with the grave goods, likely to pull the carts or sleds of the interred in the afterlife. These tombs date to before the introduction of the domesticated horse, so war carts or early chariots were also pulled by donkeys or onagers. Also from Ur and also from the mid-3rd millennium BC is this artifact, known as the Standard of Ur. It's not clear what this actually is or what it was used for, but it has two sides with mosaic inlay of colored stone and shell. One side depicts scenes of peace and the other of war. On the war side, seen here, we can see war carts pulled not by horse or oxen, but by donkeys. And this artifact is from one of the royal tombs of Ur. It's a rain ring, which, has, which can be seen in the Standard of Ur, which was used as part of the harnessing equipment on one of the war carts. This rain ring has a donkey on it, fashioned from electrum, a naturally occurring gold and silver alloy. And this may indicate that this was used on a cart that was pulled by donkeys. In these tombs, the interred individual was given grave goods that were believed to be used by them in the afterlife, like their war carts and the equids to pull them. Perhaps the most interesting and relevant ritual use of donkeys comes from Syria during the Bronze Age. Texts, especially from the site of Mari, indicate that donkeys were ritually killed as part of peace treaties. The phrase, kill a jackass, has a colloquial meaning in Amorite society to mean make a treaty. Among the Amorites in Syria, donkeys held a special place in their cultural symbolic world. Texts from Mari indicate that upon making, a, making peace, a donkey was sacrificed. And given the similarity of this practice to what we know about how covenants are ratified, the donkey was likely cut in half and the treaty partners walked between the halves to seal the peace treaty. As we just mentioned, among the Amorites, the donkey was particularly significant. The Amorites were a Semitic language-speaking people who lived in Mesopotamia, Syria, and parts of Palestine. They're often paralleled in the biblical text with the Canaanites, with the Canaanites usually being inhabitants of the low coastal area and the Amorites as inhabitants of the hill country. We have an Amorite letter published as ARM 676 that demonstrates the prominent place of donkeys in Amorite culture. In this letter, which dates to between 1775 and 1761 BC, a governor, Badi Lim, writes to Zimri Lim, the king of Mari. He recalls how he, recalls how he said to the king, Today the land of Yarihu tribesmen is given to you. Yet this land is still clothed in Akkadian garb. My lord should pay honor to his majesty. Since you are first king of the nomads and you are second king of Akkad, my lord ought not ride horses. Rather, it is upon a palanquin or on mules that my lord ought to ride. And in this way, he can pay honor to his majesty. Now, this letter can be confusing. What it seems to be showing is a governor of Mari riding to the king and reminding him not to forget his roots. He's king of the Amorites first and king of the Akkadians, the settled people of Mesopotamia, second. The king has been presenting himself as Akkadian, wearing Akkadian clothes and riding horses. But when he comes back to Mari for a public appearance, he should remember who he, who he is and dress like an Amorite and behave like an Amorite king. And that means, among other things, riding a mule or a donkey. This is perhaps the clearest example, but it seems that among Northwest Semitic speaking nomadic people, the donkey or mule had special significance as the steed of the king. Donkeys were also used by other high status individuals. This text relates how a donkey was to be apportioned out of war booty uh, to be used by one Lup Ahum, a prophet of the god Dagon. While the prophet is not the king in status, he is certainly a high status individual and rides a culturally appropriate high status steed, a donkey. 
It's important to note that this particular example predates all of the written parts of the Bible, so we should be cautious when applying it to how we understand the Bible itself. However, we should keep in mind as we think through the customs and traditions of people who are similar to and descendants uh, from the Amorites. We see high status people riding donkeys in Ugaritic literature too. In the legend of Akha, the son of Dani Ilu is killed and a drought comes on the country. Dani Ilu instructs his daughter to get his donkey prepared for a journey. Dani Ilu is at the very least a nobleman in this story and probably a king. He was renowned in ancient literature for his wisdom. He's likely the figure mentioned in Ezekiel 14, 12 to 20 and 28, 20, 28, 3. So we see not only among the Amorites, but also at Ugra, high status people using donkeys as their preferred means of transport. Donkeys show up throughout the Bible, and in the Bible they have numerous associations. Some of these associations are the same as in the broader ancient world, and some are different. For example, donkeys are the quintessential beast of burden in the Bible. Joseph's brothers used donkeys when they traveled down to Egypt. We see donkeys as beasts of burden for cargo or people in Joshua 9, Judges 19, Numbers 22, 1 Samuel 25, 1 Kings 13, and many other places. Mary rides a donkey to Bethlehem in the birth narratives of Jesus. A good idea for someone going on a long journey while nine months pregnant. Donkeys often have negative moral associations in the Bible. Uh, the donkey and equids in general are characterized as licentious, as seen in Ezekiel 23.20. They are seen as stubborn, lazy, and generally a difficult animal, like in Deuteronomy 22.4 and Proverbs 26.3. But donkeys are also associated with being items of value and of use by high-status people. Prophets rode on donkeys, as we see in 1 Kings 13 and Numbers 22. Now, this latter story is particularly interesting. It's the story of Balaam the prophet, who was contracted by the Moabites to curse the Israelites. As he is going to a mountain to curse Israel, his donkey sees an angel and refuses to move. As Balaam beats the donkey, it speaks to him, and Balaam hears from the Lord, ultimately leading him to bless instead of to curse Israel. In this case, the donkey's stubbornness and laziness actually saves Balaam's life. Other high-status people like judges rode donkeys, as we see in Judges 10.4 and 12.14. Most notably, Israelite royalty used donkeys. When Saul is about to be anointed king of Israel, he is searching for his father's donkeys. David's sons rode on mules. Solomon rode on David's mule as he went to be anointed and to enter Jerusalem as the rightful son and heir of David. The mule was a part of what legitimized him as the successor of David. Zechariah 9.9 also indicates that the king of Israel will ride on a donkey, but not just any donkey. Hebrew has several words to differentiate between donkeys male and female, and purebred or crossbreeds. In Zechariah 9.9, it is a purebred donkey, the foal of a jenny, a female donkey. It is a donkey, not a mule or horse, that is to mark the king of Israel. It seems to be this distinction which is made here. Horses were the prestige animals of the ancient world and specialized weapons of war. The donkey was symbolically more aligned with peace, perhaps humility and victory, as opposed to the horse as a symbol of conquest and victory. Both animals were equally royal symbols, but the connotations of each were distinct. One final association of donkeys in the Bible is their linkage with death. As a literary trope, they sometimes are portrayed as leading their rider to death, either directly or indirectly. We th see this in passages like 2 Samuel 17.23, 2 Samuel 18.9, and 1 Kings 13.24-29. All of these rich symbols come together in perhaps the most famous episode in the Bible involving a donkey, Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. Jesus arranges to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey, enacting and fulfilling the prophecy of Zechariah 9, 9 and 10, as Matthew 21, 4 and 5 tells us. These verses state, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion! Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem! Behold, your king is coming to you! He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem, and the bow of war will be cut off, and he will speak peace to the nations, and his dominion will be from sea to sea, 
and from the river to the ends of the earth. As he prepares for his final week, Jesus makes a clear statement about who he is, a persecuted prophet, a righteous judge, the true king of Israel. Now, these verses emphasize the humility and peace associated with this royal steed. Verse 10 goes further and proclaims the end of the elements of war, the chariot, the horse, and the bow. In fulfilling these verses, Jesus is saying that he comes in peace to rule in peace. Now, this donkey, of course, is also carrying Jesus to his death. Just five days later, he will be arrested and crucified, the righteous judge unjustly condemned as a criminal. The cheers of the crowd, Hosanna to the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest, they echo the words of Psalm 118, a hymn praising God's salvation that was sung as part of the sacrificial procession. Jesus, the prophet, priest, and king, joins in the procession as the sacrifice that will be offered. Just as the donkey carried Jesus' mother to the place of his birth, so this donkey carries Jesus to the place of his death, where he will offer his life for the life of the world. Thanks for joining us for this Beneath the Bible video. If you're interested in learning more about this topic, we've included some references and resources in the description below. If you enjoyed this video and you want to see more content like it, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook and Twitter at Beneath the Bible. If you learned something new today, take a minute to share this video with your friends. And until next time, keep digging.